Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. And Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. It's great to say Merry Christmas and not, not Happy Holidays, right? Amen. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Christ was born. Hallelujah. If you'll bow with me, let us ask the Lord to bless our time together as one. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you also for the rain, Lord, that you've brought. For you know, we know that it is much needed. For the snow in the mountains, Lord. And especially we thank you, Lord, for the expression of your love that is found in the birth of our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for those that are here today, for those that are tuning in on Zoom or, and later on on Facebook or YouTube or whatever media they decide to hear today's message. And we pray, Lord, that this coming year, Father, that your people are busy telling others, Lord, about the birth of our Savior, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to you but through him. We thank you for our eternal life, and we thank you for everything that we have, Lord. For you are the giver of good things. And we thank you in the name of Jesus. Bless the message today, Lord. Fill it into our hearts. Let us contemplate it. Let us draw closer to you. And then go out and tell others about the wonderful news that is Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Well, we don't have many bulletins to, or what do you call these announcements? I tell you, I have those moments. Um, we have one, and that's for this coming Saturday, watch night. 6 p.m., that's this Saturday, December the 31st at 6 p.m. There will be a sign-up. Friday. Friday. <laughs> oh, man, I quit. No, uh, sorry about that. It's Friday, Friday, December the 31st. I was just trying to see if you guys were awake. <laughs> Friday, December the uh, 31st at 6 p.m. There will be sign-ups after service in the foyer. That's the extent of our announcements. Thank you, <laughs> Pastor. I got a calendar here. Let me triple check that. <laughs> yes, uh, <clears throat> New Year's Eve is Friday. Friday. No Awana. No Awana. But we do have watch night service. We're going to have a continental, not continental, a uh, international menu, all different kinds of food. We're going to have a short message, we're going to have communion, and we'll get you home at a good time. We start at 6, before all the gunshots ring out, we will get you out of here. But come, come to church and uh, bring in the new year together with us. We also have a very brief executive board meeting right after the service. Uh, I wouldn't call it an emergency meeting, but we really have to make one decision. So if you can just stay, if you're on the board, we can make a quick decision. We'll get you out of here. We have some visitors this morning. We've got some visitors from Colorado Springs. Uh, we have Edgar and his wife, Diane, and they are here. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It's good to see you guys. All right, and we have, uh, Sukora, you have a guest. Yes, I do. This is uh, Linda. I uh, met her last year when I was in Colorado. Uh, she was the last person that took here. She was at home. I thought she was at home, but she was in the back. So we went yesterday to deliver the gifts for the children at Rainbow Tree, and I had invited her to come to service, and here she is, Linda. Amen. Amen. 
And Linda, you live in the area? Yes, I do. All right. Well, we're so glad. Don Julian. Don Julian, that way. Oh, Don Julian. All right. Well, maybe uh, maybe she's neighbors with uh, Sabino and Dolores out there, Don Julian. No? All right. Oh, I don't know where they I'm sorry. They're in that area. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Okay, well, thank you for being with us. I hope the kids enjoy their gifts. I think we gave uh, 32 uh, families, Bertha? 32. 35 children. 35 children. Praise God. 20 families. You did a great job, Bertha, you and your team. And Bertha is... Bertha is such a hard worker. She was literally here at the church for the last month, every at least three, four times a week. Should have given you a key. She needed me to open the door. But uh... all right. And we also express our condolences uh, to our brother John Serrano. He lost uh, his wife, uh, our dear sister Elia went home to be with the Lord as most of you know and uh, services will probably be in February <clears throat> actually I have the exact date uh, if you want to mark this down it's going to be February 5th here at the church 11 in the morning February 5th services for Elias Serrano all right Praise God, John was with us yesterday. Yes. All right, we're going to do something uh, different this morning because we want to extend Christmas just a little bit. We're going to look at three things. The day before Christmas, Christmas Day itself, and the day after Christmas because we are the day after Christmas, right? Christmas was yesterday. So the day before Christmas, the day of Christmas, and the day after Christmas. Bow with me in a word of prayer. Our Father, we come before you and thank you for our guests being with us this morning. And thank you, Lord, for all the wonderful families here in the church. We pray you would continue, Lord, to bless their lives as they live for you another year that you would encourage them and guide them and direct them and Lord we pray for our brother John as he carries on Lord as a, a man that had been married for almost 50 years uh, that you would help him Lord as he as he continues serving and living father we know he still has a lot of responsibilities his children his grandchildren his great-grandchildren all still depend on him and we pray you would strengthen him and help him father that you would help us as a church to express our love to him uh, and we thank you we pray you would bless your word now in Jesus name amen John chapter 1. Day before Christmas, the day of Christmas, and the day after Christmas is all in John chapters 1 and 2. And that is where we will begin. Now when I say the day before Christmas, on Christmas Day, Christ was born. And we all know that. But Christ existed in eternity before he became a man on Christmas Day. So John chapter 1, unlike the other Gospels, talks about the pre-existence of Christ his life before 
the incarnation, his life before he became a baby in the manger. So John chapter 1 verse 1 speaks about the day before Christmas. The pre-incarnate Christ. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Now we say, well, who is the Word? Well, verse 2, He, the Word was a person. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Word is a reference to the pre-incarnate Christ. First of all, we see from this text the eternal nature of Christ. The eternality of Christ. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning. Literally, before the beginning of time, before the universe was created, before the beginning of the beginning was the Word. He existed before the beginning. He's eternal. He's eternal. This speaks about the eternal nature of Christ. He's always existed. He's always existed. Now one of the questions little children ask, and as you grow up you stop asking this question, who made God? Who made Christ? Well, nobody made God. He has always existed. He has always been. No one made God. Say, so, well, I can't fathom that because everything has a maker. Everything has a beginning. Well, if you don't accept the eternality of Christ, then how do you answer the question of the existence of anything? You have to accept this premise that no one made Christ, He's eternal, He's always existed. And then everything else makes sense. But if you deny that, nothing makes sense. Then where did it all start? Where did the universe come from? Where did life begin? If there wasn't a begin, if there wasn't someone eternal, then how did it all begin? So if you accept one great truth, everything else makes sense. But if you deny that truth, then nothing makes sense. So the eternality of Christ. And then we have the, the, tr the triunity of Christ. This is another amazing thought. He, Christ, was in the beginning with God. With God. Face-to-face -face relationship. He was in the beginning with God in a face-to-face -face 
relationship. This speaks about the Trinity. The Trinity or the tri-unity of Christ. He was face to face in the beginning with God. See, that's another amazing truth. That's another mind expanding, mind blowing reality. He was in the beginning with God. The verse prior says the word was God. The word Christ was God. But then verse 2 seems to imply there are two different distinct personalities. He is here and God is here. But verse 1 says he, the word, was God. How do you figure all that out? Well, it's unfathomable. But it's a picture of one God existing in three distinct persons, yet being one God. He was in the beginning with God. In a beautiful relationship, God was never lonely. People say, well, why did God create the human race? Because he was lonely and he needed fellowship. No, God was never lonely. Amen. He created the human race for his glory, but not because he was lonely, because the Trinity was always in relationship with one another. Unfathomable truths. The eternality of Christ the triunity of Christ. These are beautiful, unfathomable truths. I would say they're mysteries, but really they're not because they're disclosed. A mystery is something that's not disclosed, that's not revealed, but these truths are, are disclosed to us and revealed to us. We can't totally fathom them, but we exalt in them. Amen. We exalt in them. And then we have the deity of Christ. Verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The Word was God, the deity of Christ. You mean the baby in the manger was God? Yes. God that assumed another nature, man, the God-man. For all eternity, God the second person, Christ, existed. But on that first Christmas morning, he assumed another nature. He took upon himself another nature without... Leaving his deity. So he was always God. But he became man as well. Here's another wonderful mystery. Or not mystery. Truth. He's God. A hundred percent. He never. Divested himself of his deity. But he assumed another nature. Man. A hundred percent. So you put those together and you've got the God man. Fully God, truly man, in the same person, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus Christ is the most amazing person in the history of the world because he is the God man. In perfect union. And when he ascended back into heaven, he took his body with him. Amen. So he's always the God man. For all eternity. He has a glorified body for all eternity. 
So why didn't he just leave his body behind? He, he died, he rose, couldn't he just have ascended back into heaven in his pre-exalted state and left the body behind? He took it with him. So, well, is Jesus in a body today? Yes, his glorified body that he resurrected with. We're all going to be with him someday in glorified bodies. Praise God. Without sin, without weariness, without problems, without sickness. So we see the deity of Christ. Then we see in verse 3, the creation of Christ. All things came into being through what? Him. That man, the Word, all things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In other words, He created everything. So, well, didn't God the Father create everything? God the Father was the author of creation. God the Son was the agent of creation. So, well, that doesn't help me. That makes it more complicated. God the Father was the general contractor, and he, the one that really did the work was Christ. That might help a little bit more. You know, like when you get work done at your house, you get a general contractor, he's got all the fancy paperwork and he signs everything off, but then you never see him again. Who do you see? You see the workers. They're the ones that actually do the work. And they probably know more than he does, but he's got the paperwork. So, I so well, I don't use contractors. The creation of Christ. All things came into being through Him. All things. He's given life to all things. The existence of all things is attributed to Him. All things came into being through Him, not through accidents. Not through evolution. Not through... Spontaneous combustion, not through big cosmic bangs. It all came into being through Him. He's the creation. He's the creation of all things. And then the life-giving nature of Christ, verse 4. In Him was life. Life in all of its components. The source of life. The quality of life. The nature of eternal life in him was life. He's the source of life. Eternal life comes from him. It's all in him. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Wow, something evil is taking place in verse 5. There's something evil going on there. Why didn't the darkness comprehend it? There is light, but the darkness did not comprehend it or overpower it, depending on how you translate that word. Why didn't the darkness comprehend, understand the light that was there? Because they didn't want to. They kept their eyes closed. The light is on, but they kept their eyes closed. They didn't want to see the light. They didn't want to comprehend it. They didn't want to fathom it. They didn't want to follow its direction. The light was on, but they kept their eyes closed. That's man. That's the nature of man, fallen man. I don't want to see the light. Keep their eyes closed. In opposition to the light. In opposition to the light. They're like cockroaches at night when you go out for a 
cup of milk or water and you turn the light on in your kitchen and there's roaches running around. Why? They don't want to see the light. They run back underneath the stove or the refrigerator. I know none of your houses have that problem. So that's the day before Christmas. The day before Christmas. Before the incarnation. That's what it's speaking about. Now how about the day of Christmas? Well, we're in John. Chapter 1 verse 9. This is the day of Christmas. There was the true light. Which coming into the world. Enlightens every man coming into the world what is that a reference to Christ coming into the world that's Christmas he was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him he came to his own his own people the Jews and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Verse 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory. That's the first Christmas. Verse 9. The true light came into the world. Verse 14. He became flesh. Flesh. He became a man. He became a complete man. A true man. A real man. Jesus was a man. He was born of a woman just like you and I. We all came into the world the same way. The same way. Through a woman with a womb. Jesus came through a woman. That's why he had to be born. Why couldn't God just pop Jesus out into the world by him as, a, as a child? There he is. Why did he have to go through the whole thing of being in Mary's womb? And because if he just threw him out into the world, he wouldn't have been a real man. Because real people are born. So Jesus was born. Jesus got tired. Why was he sleeping on the boat? Because he was a real man. Are you sleepy? You are, I can tell. I bet you right now, if we turn the lights off and put some nice music, we could all take a nice nap. I could put my head right here and I would fall asleep. Jesus fell asleep. But he's God, but he's also man. Jesus said on the cross, I thirst. He got thirsty. He got hungry. He was a real man. I read in a theological book. This is not some little weird book. I read this. And they asked the question. I'd never thought of it. Do you think Jesus ever got in a fight? How many of you have ever gotten in a real physical fight? Oh, only the women raised their hands. <laughs> I think I've gotten in three fights in my whole life. Rawls probably gotten in a lot of fights. He's a brawler, but he's changed. Don't mess with him though. Or John Patino back there. He's another brawler. There's Hugo right there. I look at Jesus. There's a lot of brawlers in here. Do you think Jesus ever got in a fight? And the author said, of course he did. I said, really? It is possible to have a righteous, sinless fight 
Amen. Maybe you're fighting for somebody's getting bullied and you in righteous indignation protect them and you fight the bully. Now I had this conversation. I said, what do you think of that, Raul? He doesn't, I don't know, have you thought about it? He doesn't think Jesus ever had a fight. But I, I think maybe he did. He was, an, he was the eldest brother. He had half brothers, four of them, and two, at least two half sisters. So he was raised with six half siblings. Now I'm not saying he fought them, because that probably would be in anger. But it is possible to have a righteous fight. Just like it's possible to have a holy war. So I'd never thought of that. Jesus was a, if Jesus was a real man, 100% man, he got hungry, he got thirsty, he slept, he ate. Could he ever have had a fight? I mean, I've watched, I like to watch boxing. And I watched, uh, Oh, I knew I should have wrote these guys' names down. Anyway, two great boxers. This in a, a classic fight from about 10 years ago. And at the end of the fight, they kissed each other. They, they literally kissed each other. It was Canelo and that Puerto Rican fighter, the great fighter. Uh, who? Garfield. <laughs> anyway, there was no anger. They didn't hate each other. So I'm thinking, you know, Jesus was 100% man. It's possible that he had, he had a couple fights. Couple, the money changers. Now he, he was, he was, uh, he drove them out. That was, that was righteous anger. So. Now that we solved that, now that we saw, now don't go having fights because you're not sinless. You avoid fights. You're not sinless and most of your fights are prompted by sin and retaliation and bad moods. So don't, you, you walk away as much as you can because you're not Jesus. You're not Jesus. Well, they say, well, Jesus drank wine and you're not Jesus, okay? <laughs> you're not Jesus. So this is the day of Christmas. He became a man. Now, let's finish off with this. The, today is what? The day after Christmas. The day after Christmas. Now, a lot of people are kind of sad the day after Christmas. Because you spend so much time preparing for Christmas and you anticipate it and you prepare for it and you make special food and you decorate your homes and you wrap gifts and then it's over and you've got to take the tree down that's why we don't take it down right away that'll be up there for at least into January <laughs> At least in the giant, and we don't mind because it, re, it took a long time to put that tree up. Why just take it down right away? It's kind of a set. Now, how can you keep Christmas alive all year long? That's the goal to keep Christmas alive. How do you do it? Well, let's look at we're here in John. Chapter 1, verse 14. Let's look at John the Baptist and some of Jesus' early apostles here and how you can keep Christmas alive all year long. First of all, extol Christ. Glorify Christ. Speak of Christ. Amen. Verse 14. And the Word became flesh, dwelt among us. We saw His glory. Glory as, the, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. The only begotten. That speaks about the only unique one. 
one of a kind, only begotten, one of a kind, totally unique, preeminent one. He is the preeminent one. He is the only one. He is the totally unique one. And we have to get that into our minds and extol the glories of Christ. We saw His glory as of the only begotten. His glory. He's glorious. Let the glory of Christ penetrate you, envelop you, and extol the glories of Christ all year long. Amen. Keep Christmas alive all year long. Verse 15, live in submission to Christ. John testified about him and cried out, This is he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. He has a higher rank than I. He is way up here and I am way down here. I live in submission to him because he has a higher rank. He's my commanding general. He is my Lord. He's got a higher rank. Now a lot of people live their lives like if they are the general. They're a five star general in their minds. And everybody is subservient to them. No. There's one that has a higher rank than you. Live in submission to Christ. He outranks us all. Higher rank. Live with courage to confess Christ. Verse 19. This is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent to him priests and Levites. That was intimidating. From Jerusalem. To ask him, who are you? And he confessed. He did not deny, but confessed. I'm not the Christ. They asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you? That we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. Who are you? He confessed. He did not deny. I am a voice. Make straight the way of the Lord. I'm a mouthpiece. I'm a little feeble mouthpiece. Trying to make straight the way of the Lord. That's the way we have to live, beloved. We have to be a voice of one crying in the will. We are voices for Christ. Live with courage. Don't deny, but confess. Don't deny, confess. Live with humility, verse 27. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. Totally totally humble. I'm not worthy to untie his shoelace. I'm not worthy to untie. And John was great. He was famous. John was famous in his time. Thousands upon thousands of people flocked into the wilderness to be baptized and to hear the great John the Baptist. But he said, you know what? I'm nothing. I'm not even fit to untie his shoelace. Total humility. And then live with purpose and passion. Verse 29. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him. This is John the Baptist. He saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Verse 35, again the next day John was standing with two of his disciples and he looked, and he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold the Lamb of God. 
The two disciples heard him speak. They followed Jesus. They left John and started to follow Jesus. And that's the plan. Verse 40. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew. Simon Peter's brother. He found first his own brother Simon and said to him, We found the Messiah, which is translated Christ. He brought him to Jesus. He brought his brother to Jesus. Verse 43. The next day he purposed to go into Galilee. He found Philip. And Jesus said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Beth Bethsaida of the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote. And Nathanael followed Christ. So, John the Baptist, behold the Lamb of God. And they started to follow the Lamb of God. And Andrew found his brother Peter. Peter And that's the way it works. We are to live that way. Find somebody and say, we have found Jesus. You too can find him. Live with passion and purpose. So how to keep Christmas alive? Well, first of all, exalt Christ. Second of all, celebrate life. Look at chapter 2 of John, verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding. You like going to weddings? There was a wedding in Canaan of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And they accepted the invitation. And they went to celebrate the wedding. The wedding. Celebrate life. Don't be Ebenezer Scrooge. Don't be the Grinch. Learn to celebrate life. Find reasons to celebrate. Christmas is over, but you've got New Year's. New Year's is over, but a month after that, there's Valentine's Day, Day of Love. Celebrate that. You can find ways to celebrate. I mean, you could you could start. Um, you know, we don't celebrate Halloween, but that kind of kind of kind of an introduct is an introduction to uh, the holiday season. You've got Halloween, then you've got Thanksgiving, then you've got Christmas, then you've got New Year's, then you've got Valentine's Day if you want to go there. And then after that, there's Easter. That's six months of celebrating. Then you can take a little break. And then you've got summer, and you can do something in the summer. You've got vacations, and then you take a little breather there, and then you start up all over again. Find reasons to celebrate. Celebrate life. When you're invited to go somewhere to a gathering, I mean, go. Get yourself in a good mood. Say, you know, I don't really want to go. I mean, for me, I prefer just to stay home. I just like to sit on the couch and relax. But then I got to rebuke myself. I say, no, that's your daughter's graduation. Maybe you should go. <laughs> yeah, but it's all the way in L.A. and I got to fight. Where am I going to park? <laughs> I got to fight all the homelessness and she'll understand. I'll find an excuse. No, you got to get yourself in a good mood. Put all the... Obstacles out of your mind. You'll find parking. 
You're going to have to pay for it, but you're going to find it. And go celebrate. Celebrate. Yeah, but I had two graduations in one week. Two daughters graduated. Camille and Natalie. Couldn't they have separated it? I'm an old man. How am I going to pull this off? So you've got to just kind of... Christmas Eve. Invite it to your uncle's house. It's cold. It's raining. He lives a long way away. Well, what are you going to do? I to stay home and watch a movie. You got to force yourself to celebrate, and then when you do it, you'll enjoy yourself. Celebrate life with your loved ones. Go to if you're invited to a wedding, go to the wedding. Don't find a reason to say no. Don't find a reason. I was invited uh, next week to go to a ordination service for a pastor out in uh, Riverside. It's a long drive. Riverside. I think I got to go through Moreno Valley. I don't want to go through that town. But you know what? It's, it's, it's an ordination celebration. Once in a lifetime for this young man. Get yourself in a good mood. Find yourself a pastor friend from the area and go and enjoy yourself. <clears throat> go and enjoy yourself. And then, you know, every week Christians celebrate on Sunday. Sunday's a celebration. It's the Lord's Day. We celebrate life every Sunday. Maybe this year you can say, I'm going to stop being a two-time-a-month Christian. I go to church twice a month, and the other two times I watch it online. I mean, if you really have to do that, okay, but you don't get the fellowship online at home. Come to church and come with the mindset, I'm going to celebrate life with my brothers and sisters. I'm not going to run out after church and be the first one out the, out the parking lot so no one can talk to me or ask me for something. I know they're in the back there. I know they're in the back and they want me to sign up for something. I'm going to go out that door. And I'm not coming to watch night. Why not? What are you going to be doing? It's a couple hours. Come, get, get yourself in a good spirit and celebrate. Learn to celebrate. Learn to celebrate life like Jesus did. He celebrated life. That, that way you can keep Christmas alive. So we've seen three things. The day before Christmas. Christmas Day and the day after Christmas. And that's where we're living now. The day after Christmas. Ex exalt Christ and celebrate life for the glory of God. Amen. Someday he'll take you home, but not now. For now we work, we live, we play, we celebrate Amen. for the glory of God. We'd like to invite our ushers forward as we celebrate giving. See, oh, now you're asking for a lot. Well, what else are you going to give to? <clears throat> you definitely don't have to go out and buy food. You've got a lot of food at home. Now I come to my house. A lot of food. Let's ask God's blessing on this morning's offering. And then after this offering, we're going to take a second offering for John. So let's, ushers, you can make your way back once you. Our Father, we come before you and all of life is about Christmas. Help us to exalt you and to celebrate. 
to get ourselves, Lord, in a celebratory mode, to rebuke ourselves when we start to get grumpy, negative, to slap ourselves upside the head and say, get it together, man. Celebrate. Jesus went to a wedding. Help us to exalt you, to glorify you. And Lord, help us to continue supporting your work faithfully through our giving. Please be pleased with our offering now. In Jesus' name, amen.